Thank you. Thank you all very much for the kind introduction, Dean, and thank you all for a warm welcome. Uh, it is wonderful to be with you. It is a privilege to remind you what a privilege each of you has uh, by being in the chair that you're in, whether you are student, faculty, staff, or photographer. Uh, this is the, <laughs> you are, there, there he is right there. Uh, he can vouch that we moved, how was it, 20 veterans through and uh, 30 veterans through, less than 30 seconds per. So, I mean, it, the all-stars are everywhere here at Stanford. And it really is a privilege to be back here, the, although the first time uh, at the business school. And George, thanks for doing this and to all of you for twisting my arm until I finally showed up. <laughs> Thank you, sir, for joining us and for your tremendous service to our country. Um, General Sir Petraeus, before we begin, we have many veterans with us here in the audience. Um, if I may, I'd like to ask all the veterans present, please, to rise so that we may <coughs> recognize you. Who else? chance to meet with most of them beforehand uh, and obviously thanked him for all they've done, uh, particularly since 9-11. Almost all of them are members of what we term the new greatest generation uh, and very much deserve the, the recognition that you all have kindly just provided to them. But it was wonderful to be back. These are members of my tribe. Uh, I was the sheikh of the tribe in various places along the way. Uh, and great to spend time with them again, but great to be here. You know, I'm in a new tribe now, uh, the, the business world tribe, the private equity world. Uh, it, it actually has been great. I have learned that the highest calling in life after government service uh, actually is private equity. <laughs> I'm not joking. <laughs> um, it really is. I actually believe in the concept where you provide not just capital, uh, but expertise, assistance, support, guidance, and all the rest of that to, to firms, mostly private, although we do do public equities. By the way, I must confess that I took the position with KKR without a complete understanding of the difference between private and public equities. I've <laughs> sought to learn a few things in the last five years, but you're, there's a great business world out there for those of you who haven't been in it already, uh, and the the inherent strengths of the U.S. system are, are quite substantial, despite the, the occasional shortcoming or noise that we may experience as well. Go ahead. Um, sir, we will uh, definitely get to that part of your career. Um, to kick things off, I'd like to start with some examples of leadership and judgment from your military career. Um, you've described the ideal leadership style as adaptive and affirmative. Uh, drawing from your own experiences, could you elaborate on what that style looks like in practice? Sure. Um, I mean, adaptive is pretty straightforward. Uh, it essentially means that you are learning faster than the competition. In the battlefield, we, we literally had a saying. It was in the counterinsurgency field manual, in fact, that we drafted when I was a three-star back in the States between the three-star and four-star tours in Iraq. We said that the side that learns the fastest typically prevails, and the same is true in any uh, endeavor any walk of life. So you're constantly trying to figure out how can you learn faster? Uh, how can you become a learning individual and how can you ensure that your organization collectively is learning? And it's not enough just to say it or to repeat it or to emphasize it, write about it. You actually have to have formal mechanisms uh, to sit down and consider what is it that we should have learned. I might, in fact, right here just sort of talk about, because everything keeps coming back to what I've described as the tasks of a strategic leader. There are four of these tasks. They are equally valid in the business world, the military world, the intelligence world, any world. Uh, essentially, the strategic leader for an organization, or sometimes co-leaders, as the case at KKR and many other businesses, uh, is the the tasks are to get the big ideas right, in other words, to get the right strategy, to communicate those effectively throughout the breadth and depth of the organization, to oversee their implementation, and then to determine how you have to refine the big ideas and do it all over again and again and again. And 
facilitating adaptation and being an adaptive leader uh, means that that fourth step is a formal step. This isn't something that you just sort of do while you're running or in the shower or moments of reflection or something like that. You have to actually sit down and there's a structured process by which those who are who you're privileged to lead, and it could be 165,000 American men and women in uniform in the surge, or 250,000 in Central Command, um, or you know it can be 60 people in a startup. Uh, but the strategic leader has to get those tasks right regardless. Um, I often said that the surge in Iraq that mattered most was not the surge of forces. We added 25,000, 30,000 forces to an existing nearly 140,000 and drove violence down by 85% in 18 months after it had been going up and up and up and up and up. Um, and the reason for that was not the extra forces, it wasn't that surge, it was the surge of ideas, the big ideas. And every one of the big ideas was 180 degrees different from what we were doing before. Most significantly was that we'd been withdrawing from living with the population, getting out of the people's faces as it was termed, because we thought we were part of the problem instead of part of the solution, and because the prime minister wanted us to hand off more rapidly to Iraqis tasks that they couldn't handle. But we were consolidating on big bases. And the more we did that, you ended up with a situation that was captured brilliantly in a New York Times story, the title of which was Driving Around Baghdad Waiting to Get Blown Up. This is how a Sergeant First Class described what he was doing on a daily basis in Iraq, because they'd basically leave their big base, they'd go drive around the neighborhood a few times, every now and then they'd get blown up, and then they'd go back to the big base generally uh, for dinner or for, for the night. Obviously, that does not provide security to the people, which is the number one task and the foundation on which all else is built. If you don't have security, obviously, you, don't, you can't do anything else. And keep in mind that when the surge decision was made in December of 2006, there were 53 dead civilian bodies due to violence every 24 hours just in Baghdad. That's the capital city of the country. Obviously, there's nothing going on except for survival. So again, you've got to improve security. And big idea number one was you have to live with the people to secure them. Um, and again, number one task is to secure and actually to serve the people. Next was, by the way, stop handing off to the Iraqis, take it back over, even if not formally. Uh, third was you, have, you can't kill or capture your way out of an industrial strength insurgency. You have to reconcile with as many of the rank and file as you possibly can. That meant sitting down, yep, with people who had our blood on their hands, something that the battalion brigade commanders brought to my attention, as you might imagine. But then I would re remind them that this is how these endeavors end. So big ideas are crucial. By the way, they don't usually hit you on the head like Newton's apple fully formed if you sit under the right tree. You tend to get hit on the head by a seed of a big idea, and then you have to sort of shape it like a clay object. Play with it. Ideally, you do it transparently, very inclusively, because you want everybody feeling as if they're inside the tent, because you know what happens if they're outside the tent. And so that process, and then it's iterative as well. You're constantly refining the big ideas. Uh, but th what got me started on this is, again, the need for that fourth step, which is a formal process. Uh, in our case, we had all these lessons learned teams on the battlefield. I used to remind them that they weren't le learning lessons. They just identified lessons, but I wasn't going to change the signage on all of their headquarters. That would cost too much. But they just needed to understand that a lesson is only learned once it's actually incorporated in the big ideas, communicated in the mission statement. The the civil military campaign plan, all the rest of this, uh, and then overseen. And again, there's many, many subtasks for each one of these. By the way, I've actually spelled this out uh, for those who want to get more on it. There's a, at the Harvard Kennedy School, the Belfer Center uh, has a website uh, that we created on strategic leadership. Just Google Petraeus on street strategic leadership at the Belfer Center. Um, so we've worked our way through that. And so again, the adaptive component is something that's not just a state of mind or a phrase or, or an ambition. It's a formal process. And by the way, the great business leaders of America, when you talk to them, typically have something just like that. And I'll give the example of Netflix, perhaps. Reed Hastings is one of the extraordinary uh, leaders of America. He is Jeff Bezos, others that are just incredible at being able to continually reinvent the big ideas or to develop additional big ideas. 
So if you think about Netflix, the original big idea was we're going to put Blockbuster out of business by mailing videos to customers, movies. So they, that's the big idea. Uh, they communicate it. Not too big a firm then. They oversee the implementation. By the way, there's metrics. There's the battle rhythm, how the leader spends his or her time. And then they get down to the bottom. And after a couple of years, they say, well, you know what? Blockbuster went out of business. But now everybody's mailing CDs to their customers. So what do we do now? New big idea. We are going to download. Uh, broadband speeds are fast enough now. Consumers, customers can download videos. So that's the new big idea. Communicate it, oversee it. Get down here two years later. This has been fantastic. You know, we're scaling and everything else, but now everybody else is offering downloaded content. So what do we do now? Well, we create our own content. Hundred million dollars on House of Cards alone. Communicate it, do it. Get down here. Gosh, this is fantastic, but now everybody's doing that as well. So what do we do now? Well, now let's get into blockbuster midi, vid, uh, movies, you know, the real big productions. Um, and they've done seriously well there too. They've won a bunch of awards at the Cannes Film Festival, I think at the Academy Awards or whatever. I wasn't that impressed by the first movie that came out, which had Brad Pitt playing Stanley McChrystal. General McChrystal is the... <laughs> the <laughs> McChrystal has a much better sense of humor than Brad Pitt ever did, and he's not wooden, and you know, he sort of go around like a little automaton. Besides, I was really hoping, I've been hoping that Brad Pitt would hold out to play me, but um, <laughs> there was a little cameo in there by the guy he, he, that he's was. He's a bit tall, yeah, General Petraeus. Well, I guess, I know. <laughs> Come on, I mean, you know, if, if that tall guy could play Henry, Henry Kravis in uh, Barbarians at the Gates, you know, Brad could. A editorial license. That's it. Uh, actually, I, I had a tiny cameo in that movie. I've actually never watched it, in all honesty. Um, I watched the preview or what have you. But there's a, so the guy who was the gladiator uh, played me briefly in that movie. So. Anyway, so this, <laughs> it worked out a little bit for the part. But you know, anyway, um, so that's the adaptive piece. Um, affirmative leadership is, is a construct that is based on a belief uh, that everybody you're privileged to lead wants to be all that he or she can be, that they really do want to be the very best. Now look, if you're honest, um, you know, outside of Stanford and Harvard and a few other places, that may or may not be completely true. It still is the way that you ought to act until folks prove that you shouldn't act that way. And so what I mean by affirmative leadership is, you know, instead of saying, hey, George, you better have that damn report on my desk by Monday at noon or I'll have a piece of your backside, um, I say, hey, George, I, man, I heard people are talking already about this report you're going to get to me on noon and, and on Monday. And wow, I'm really excited about it already. They say it's really going to be terrific, going to set the world on fire. I don't know if I'll be able to sleep on Sunday night. I'm so excited about it. Do you want a double space just, or single space? Yeah, you, know, you know, look, I've just put a whole, you know, big rock in his rucksack. He knows he's really got to produce now, but I did it affirmatively uh, rather than negatively. And so that's the concept, I think, uh, that we talk about there. Fantastic. A lot of useful leadership lessons there. Don't forget preemptive praise. So this is where you walk into Prime Minister Maliki in the Iraqi White House and you say, Prime Minister, I, no need to say anything. I have heard that you are pursuing this particular initiative and that you're working out the construct of it and how to implement it and all that. No need to say anything, Prime Minister, because of course he has no intention to do this at all. But you just keep going and going and going until you realize he's finally sort of capitulating and realize, oh, Petraeus will never stop until I just say, okay, I, yes, I am pursuing that initiative. And then, of course, he does, and it succeeds, and he said, man, I had this initiative. General, wasn't that a great initiative that I had? Again, consider that approach as well. <laughs> I, I wanted to return a little bit to your, to your military career. You've talked a bit about the surge mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I think all of us could benefit a lot from understanding um, how you, at this point, you staked your career on this on this strategy. How did you handle any doubts or concerns you might have had about the strategy? Well, first of all, I mean, at the end of the day, it's all about results. Um, and you know, I was born and raised by a, a old crusty Dutch sea captain, Dutch American, and, and a librarian mother, um, and 
I remember when I'd come home from school or something like that, and you know, it wasn't all A's or it wasn't exactly what it should have been. He just sort of look at, and I'd start offering. Well, you know, I just, you know, I had so much going on in the sports and all this. He just sort of look at me until I stopped and he'd say, "Results, boy." And results, at the end of the day, uh, was what enabled us to continue. Uh, the surge. We had six months basically to show that this was going to work. I knew that during the confirmation hearing, I was really sort of forced to agree to come back at six months. Then I came back at three months, but behind closed doors, very different dynamics than when all the cameras are on. It was sort of a scene like we saw setting up this morning on the news uh, for Mark Zuckerberg. I mean, just the whole well is full of cameras. But by that six month mark, uh, Eight of the final 11 weeks saw a precipitate drop uh, in violence. And so now you have something that is uh, very, very substantial. And then it kept on going. And ultimately, as I mentioned, it was down by 85% over 18 months. So at the end of the day, it's really about results. Now, what did I do up front? Well, I sought to convey to them, this is what we're going to do. Uh, these are the big ideas. These is, this is how they're different from what we have been doing. Um, the interesting thing is that, I mean, nobody gave us any guidance for that. I mean, people think that we were sent over there to, to implement a, quote, comprehensive civil military counterinsurgency campaign. Not at all. I mean, we just selected, confirmed, and get over there and fix it. Um, but we'd had the, this fortunate experience of 15 months where I was back between the three and four star tours during which we did the counterinsurgency field manual, did special editions of military review, counterinsurgency writing contest reshaped everything about the so-called road to deployment. The very first seminar, all of the tasks for leaders, collective training, uh, individual soldiers, organizational structures, equipment, everything, uh, so that they were also much better prepared. But we had then the intellectual foundation uh, that gave us the confidence to reverse what we were doing. In, again, sort of ironically or paradoxically, a month before the surge decision was made, the president went out to Amman, Jordan. He couldn't even land in Iraq. It was too dangerous. And the prime minister of Iraq went over there to meet with him. And they actually agreed to accelerate what we had been doing throughout 2006, which was, again, to consolidate on big bases, hand off to the Iraqis, release detainees, all the stuff that we reversed completely. I actually wasn't aware of that fully. Uh, until I got on the ground and was confronted by the National Security Advisor of Iraq over that. And at the end of which, in the very first week, Ambassador Crocker wasn't even there. And I said, Doctor, and I knew him from the three-star tour, I said, if, if it is the intention of the Prime Minister to take those actions, in other words, to accelerate what we have been doing, and I might remind you that we've assessed that the strategy is failing, so you're going to fail faster. If that's your objective, um, please ensure that the prime minister knows that he should convey that to President Bush tomorrow in the normally scheduled video conference, which I understand the commander and ambassador always attend. But he should know in advance that if he chooses to do that, he is going to do it without me because I will be on the next plane to Washington and I intend to take the policy with me. That was a fairly big deal. That was sort of what you might term an all-in moment. And I didn't sleep real well that night until I took Ambien. And then... <laughs> and then sat the next day on the edge of my chair the whole way through and he never heard anything from it again. And so we were able to go ahead and to implement what it was that, that we intended to do. So you try to explain what, what it is you're going to do. Then obviously as you start implementing it, you start trying to lay out for them, this is what it's achieving. By the way, the challenge was, and I told Congress this in advance, I said, it's gonna get harder before it gets easier because we're going back into the neighborhoods. We're going to have to fight to get back into most of these. In fact, it was a drill. You literally had to come in at last light and have it completely established with concrete walls all around it by the time the sun came up because you'd have at least one, sometimes two, suicide car bombers coming at you uh, as quickly as they could, they could generate them. Uh, and so it was a very, very challenging period. And in fact, violence did go up, casualties went up. But then thankfully, as I said, they crested and then started, but already, Iraqi civilian casualties were going down, and other very key indices and metrics uh, were going down. So again, at the end of the day, though, as you all know already and, and have had reaffirmed here, I'm sure, in your courses, um, it's about results. It is about the bottom line. It is about laying that out and understanding why it has done 
uh, what it has done. So that was a time when you very powerfully delivered the results. You've also had to deal with personal and professional setbacks in the public spotlight. Could you give us some advice about how to deal with those setbacks yeah. in public? Yeah, look, I mean, first of all, it's just, you just have to understand uh, that life is not full of high five moments. Um, there are setbacks. There are collective organizations screw things up, individuals in those organizations. We had a good platoon sergeant one time, well-meaning, who decided to use pages of a Koran for target practice at a small range that we had at every combat outpost. And a local worker, Iraqi worker, found it, you know, immediately reported it, and boom. Um, and so, you know, you end up going to the prime minister, uh, apologizing publicly. The president of the United States called. I mean, these things happen. And then, you know, you'll make mistakes of your own. Try not to, uh, obviously. Uh, but, but that happened. And obviously, uh, I did and experienced that. And I think that you know, what you do in a situation like that or any situation where there has been uh, a mistake or a setback or a shortcoming is, you know, I determined specifically what did happen, uh, why, um, own it publicly, acknowledge it, um, apologize for it if that's required, um, and most importantly, determine how to mitigate the risk of this recurring in the future. Look, we spent that I mean, that entire surge tour was spent, frankly, with that process going fairly regularly. Um, I remember at the end of it, to give you a sense of what that experience was like, I had this fantastic chief warrant officer, uh, three or four, uh, who was my, he was the head of the security detachment that we had. I don't know if we had somewhere between 40 and 60 people, something like that that most of those rotated, because again, I was there for 19 and a half months on that tour, but he was always, he stayed. And by the way, he went with me to CENTCOM and he went with me to Afghanistan, a tremendous guy. Anyway, we're coming to the end of the surge and, and every now and then at night, uh, we lived in a huge old palace complex and it was, had a man-made lake in the center of it. You know, it was quite vast. I mean, we had a six mile running route inside this compound, but I'd go for a walk uh, late at night before turning in and just to sort of gather thoughts and think about things and we just walk along the, the water and then come back and he would always go with me. We didn't need anybody else but just to make sure and he had communications as well. And normally we didn't talk or anything like that beyond a few pleasantries and this time we we're about halfway through it and I, he turned and he said, sir, can I ask a question? I said, sure, chief. Um, he said, what has it been like? Uh, you know, you what's it been like to command this surge? You know, you're criticized, you're vilified, you're attacked by a full page ad in the New York Times personally by uh, an activist organization on the day of your biggest testimony. I mean, it, you know, sort of, we've had tough casualties, we've had this, we've had that, but by God, it's worked. And now everybody, even the fiercest critics, acknowledge it, you know, what's it been like? And I said, Chief, um, it has been the most awesomely awesome of experiences on a good day. And we had less than this number of good days. <laughs> so, I mean, it's a grinding experience and leadership is like that. Um, again, leadership is, is not always in, in an upswing cycle. You know, we're, we're, we're actually trying to remind ourselves at, at KKR that we're 104 or 105 months into this particular recovery. It's, it's approaching the second longest in our history. I think 120 is the longest ever. Um, we have people in the firm who have never been in that firm when there has been a downturn. Um, and so we're actually talking about wargaming the winter is coming scenarios. Um, I didn't know what that was and they had to explain to me that there's this series called Game of Thrones or something. And <laughs> I guess winter is always coming or something, but, uh, <laughs> but that's, so we're actually, you, you've, you, and again, we know there's gonna be tough times during that. And so what is it you do to prepare for that? How do you, how do you, you know, prepare yourself personally for that kind of experience? But it is, it's a grinding experience. And the more public it is, the more, you know, you've been run up the flagpole, uh, the more that is the case. And in those, those grinding experiences, you, you clearly need to have a lot of internal strength. Since, since you stepped down from the CIA, you've worked very hard to build a new career and continue serving the country. In those difficult years that followed, how did you summon the strength to carry on? 
Well, I think, you know, uh, you got to realize that life goes on, or it should, um, and then you start figuring out, okay, you know, what are the options? Uh, what is it that would be fulfilling, rewarding, um, you know, help pay for the grandkids' education and a few other things like that? Um, and in my case, it was the idea of intellectual stimulation. Um, I don't mind travel. I mean, we just... I was in 22 countries last year alone, one of them I think six or seven times. And so, you know, busting your butt is, is okay. I mean, I've got many of my West Point classmates are literally completely retired. Um, some of them are literally down in golf communities in Florida riding around in golf carts and trying to persuade me to come down there. And, you know, what an awesome thing that is. And I think that's where I might actually pull out the service pistol and consider. But... Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, you know, you can, you, I actually outlined a leadership book. Um, it was titled Relentless, colon, um, Leadership Lessons Learned, dash, dash, some the hard way. Um, and so, but I was very, very fortunate. I mean, people called immediately and said, hey, when you're ready to resurface, come on up, come on up. I knew Henry Kravis before. That was one of, he was one of those, but there were a number of others. So there were tremendous options, but then I deliberately also um, chose to do some that were in the academic world. Uh, I taught for three and a half years every week, actually, at the Honors College of the City University of New York. Did it for a dollar a year the first year when, again, that same, or one of the activist organizations objected to the great salary they were going to pay me. Um, but it was about, again, the intellectual stimulation, the fun of interacting with students. It was on a course called the North American Decades, which is what I contended follows the American century and precedes the Chinese or Asian century. And the number of S's on the end would depend on how effective Washington is at turning le uh, legislative, regulatory, and policy headwinds into tailwinds, particularly with a focus on there were four revolutions that we were, we'd explored with a policy perspective. The IT revolution, which is the basis for most of the others. The energy revolution, unique to the US and our circumstances and a tribute to the US, because it has only happened here, uh, the manufacturing revolution and then the life sciences revolution. It was just great fun. And then I uh, have a chair at USC where I spend a week per semester, including hosting a startup event uh, most of the times that I'm there. Sometimes it's every other. Uh, but we bring in 45 or so venture capitalists. I'm actually personally uh, invested in 15 different startups, which I just enjoy doing in part because I really enjoy young leaders with great big ideas. Uh, it's very exciting, and then you can help them. Um, then you have the firms in which we're invested. I hosted the co-founder of Lyft for dinner last night. Here we have a big Menlo Park office. Um, so th it's a great, stimulating uh, life. I'm also on the speaker speaking circuit, you know, the highest form of white-collar crime in America. Um, <laughs> I, have, I want you to know I've waived my outrageous speaking fee for this great privilege. Um, but we are very I'm, grateful for that. And then there's, you know, the four, four think tanks that I'm actively a engaged with and then about a dozen veterans organizations. And so, uh, plus we have a brand new, brand new granddaughter and um, our son's dog. He's actually up at Harvard Business School doing the JD MD, or JD MBA program. And, um, and daughter and son-in-law live nearby. So it, it, I've been very, very fortunate. But you know, you, you, I was gonna use this at the end, but I might use it here. Um, luck, and I've been, I don't know, accused of or described as being lucky at a number of different van ventures over the years, um, including Command and General Staff College, graduate school, um, you know, Iraq and all these others. And, you know, my response to that, not necessarily directly when people are saying that, but is to offer that I think luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. Um, and I really sought to prepare for these opportunities. I'm, I'm very, very serious about that. And, you know, you don't want to sound presumptuous at all, but um, when I, well, back, it would be back when I was a second lieutenant, I, you know, I never really expected you're going to get to this, but by God, you know, I wanted to be prepared if the opportunity came along. And I'd been impressed by this statement that uh, Napoleon used to say, that every corporal has a field marshal's baton in his rucksack. In other words, you know, be ready. You never know. A corporal could be called 
you know, Petraeus for field marshal. And so we were actually jumping with the British paratroopers uh, when I was in my first assignment. And uh, we had an afternoon off. We jumped all morning. And the guy said, well, you want my fellow British lieutenant host said, you want to go to the pub? And I said, yeah, but let's stop by the this service store. They have stores outside all the bases in which they sell old kit and new kit and all the kinds of bells and whistles that you put on your uniform. And I said, you know, I'd like to see if they have a field marshal's baton used. Um, sort of looked at me strange. But anyway, we went in there. It was run by an old retired regimental sergeant major. These guys are super crusty. And, and uh, he said, well, you know, what do you have? And I said, well, Sergeant Major, I wonder if you have any used field marshal's batons. Um, oh, he said, fresh out of those, mate. But, you know, we have this little swagger stick. And I actually bought the swagger stick. I tied it to the frame of my rucksack, which I used all the way through, I think, two-star division command. And with green cord, 550 cord, as the veterans here would know, burned on either end and tied off with a proper knot. And nobody else could really see it. But it was there for me. And every time I lifted that rucksack, which had to be thousands of times over the years, uh, took it on and took it off and put it on, it was there reminding me that you know you need to be ready. You need to be prepared. Your individual study, your experiences, your professional development, and all the rest of that stuff. Uh, be serious about that. And you do it you know with a smile, with a joke, with a try to be self-deprecating or whatever. But at the end of the day, in the back of your mind has to be uh, that this actually could happen. And to be truthful, I mean, but for a few months here or there at different junctures, none of it may have happened. Um, but you know, that's what you do. In my post-government stuff, you know, did I prepare for that? Gosh, I don't know. I mean, I did do the academic stuff. I did not at the time thinking that I, that was what I was going to do, mingle with people who invited me to speak at their in their dining room in New York, but mostly just because I was trying to convey to people what we were doing. And these were influencers and a great opportunity. By the way, a, a great, you know, so people asked, how did you get to know Henry Kravis? And I said, well, his wife, who's a serious intellectual in her own right, um, shot me an email out of the blue one time, who's a three or a four star, and I was gonna be in New York doing something at the Council on Foreign Relations. She saw it, noticed that there was no dinner offered, and so she said, you know, you gotta eat, why don't you eat at our place? And we have a pretty good track record of people coming who are invited. In fact, she said, you can ask us to invite people. So I said, super, uh, thanks so much, Marie Jose. Um, could you invite Henry Kissinger, Mayor Bloomberg, P Police Commissioner Kelly, um, I think it was uh, Richard Holbrook, uh, and then a couple of noted intellectuals. Um, and they did, and every single one of them showed up. And I learned later, <laughs> you know, if you don't show up at Henry Kravis's table, they do a leverage buyout of your firm the next morning. <laughs> Speaking of preparation, um, we have a class at Stanford called Managing Difficult Conversations. Um, in the spirit of this class, let's imagine that you are President Petraeus and you're sitting across from North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un. It's the first face-to-face -face meeting of the leaders of the two countries. How would you make this conversation successful? Well, again, this is all about preparation. It's all about detailed study and under nuanced understanding of what has transpired before what do we think they have meant when they have used the term nuclear disarmament in the past? Hint, it's not what we think it means. Uh, and on and on and on. All the dynamics, uh, as much as you can learn about an individual who is the most difficult intelligence target in the world because he's inside the hermit kingdom, um, famously difficult place to, to operate, to, to say that it is a, quote, denied area, as the term is in the intelligence world, would be a bit of an understatement. So I think this is all about very, very rigorous preparation, very rigorous talking points with branches and sequels, you know, if this, then that, um, and, and so forth. But, you know, certainly also trying to establish a relationship to see if that is possible. Is there really, can you um, actually have some kind of meaningful strategic relationship? I, I am a huge believer in efforts to have strategic dialogue. I believe that you should, we should be having that with China. It's difficult if the key diplomats are changing at the rate and the key national security team members are changing at the rate that they have been. But this is crucial. I mean, 
if you think about what people like Henry Kissinger were able to do or others over the years that had the big breakthroughs, this came after a lot of back and forth. You know, you talk about luck being what happens when preparation meets opportunity. Henry Kissinger used to run a summer, I think it was called the Summer Center Seminar or the Senior Seminar. I went back, I actually at one point read everything that he wrote, including the books about him, which described how he prepared for these opportunities that he had uh, during the eight years that he was National Security Advisor and then Secretary of State. It was very, very deliberate. Um, he would sought to meet every you know, junior leader around the world, attract him to Harvard, have interaction with them, get to know them ahead of time. And then, of course, once he was in office, he just beat himself up on planes and everywhere else, personally engaging with them and, and again, having true strategic discuss discussions. Now, we have to be very careful to have limited aspirations for the results of a first meeting, noting that, you know, that, that Kim Jong-un had never even met the president of China, uh, the country with which North Korea has 90% of its trade back and forth uh, until just a couple of weeks ago. So he's also not the most schooled of individuals when it comes to this. Uh, but look, this, there is hope out of this, I think. Uh, this is not a forlorn hope. And by the way, some of this is the result of the so-called maximum pressure strategy that has been pursued. I'm not saying that I would have used all of the rhetoric uh, that has been deployed at different times or that message discipline has been a sterling feature of everything that's taking place here. But the fact is that a willingness to rattle the saber has gotten Chinese attention. That has forced them, together with UN Security Council resolutions that are unprecedented, uh, to actually really tighten down on the umbilical cord that literally keeps the lights on in Pyongyang. Uh, and again, 90% of it running to and from uh, China. So that has been a key catalyst for what is happening. And folks who have been part of that deserve some of the credit for that, without question. Um, and, and now we'll see if, again, this very rigorous preparation can be undertaken uh, in order to capitalize on the opportunity that, that results. And you've spoken a bit about how this um, saber rattling has taken place very publicly with a lot of media coverage. It seems that there is a real role for the, the conflict and its resolution in, in the way that the media are managed. Drawing from your own experience, could you talk a bit about how you, yep. um, how PR and image management yeah. have, have shaped your strategy and its implementation? Sure. Um, let me start by just saying, again, we had big ideas for everything during the surge and but not just in Iraq, but in Afghanistan as well. Many, some of them carried over to Afghanistan, but I also note that the very first time I did an assessment of Afghanistan, which is on my way home from a three-star tour in Iraq at Secretary Rumsfeld's request, when I briefed the secretary on return home, the very first slide was titled, Afghanistan does not equal Iraq, and laid out all the different ways in which it's tremendously different. And hence the reason when I was Central Command Commander and then uh, the nominee for command in Afghanistan that I said that we are not going to be able to do in Afghanistan what we did in Iraq. We can't flip this place. There's no way that changing the big ideas is going to have such a dramatic, and oh, by the way, to be fair, General McChrystal has already been implementing, so I'm going to be building on what it is that he has already uh, been putting into place. Um, but the big idea that I had about dealing with the pre press was quite simple. It was to be first with the truth. Uh, it was, again, if you have a bad day, we had a tremendous general officer, for example, when I first got there, who just found it difficult to go out to the podium. Look, these were horrible days that we were having. I mean, they, they blew up a part of the parliament. They dropped the old historic bridge right in the center of the Tigris River, blew up the mosque again, or a minaret of the mosque that had touched off the violence the previous year, uh, the Samara Mosque. Uh, just day after day of this kind of stuff. And what you have to do when that happens is you go out to the podium and you say, we had a horrible day today. Uh, in Baghdad, there were three markets that were bombed by four suicide bombers and 250 innocent Iraqis were killed. And then you have to talk about, okay, what did we learn from this? What are we gonna do about it? By the way, what we ultimately had to do was wall off these markets, which some of which were a mile long, just on a street and then went several streets in. Um, and they were, became no drive zones. Um, and so then we had to start searching the hand cards. But again, this is a level that you have to go to. 
he found it difficult after a while uh, to go out. And I remember we had a horrible day in Baghdad one time, and he went out and started talking about, yes, we got the soccer league is going to get going again. Look, there were areas of progress, but if you have a horrible day, you don't lead with that. And so we decided at that point that it was time to allow that individual to move on, because you've got to be first with the truth. Just lay it out uh, and get it out there. Beyond that, I actually had a briefing that I developed. Um, I think it was, again, when I was back from the Three Star Tour. Uh, and it was titled Dealing with the Press. And it started out, it said, you can't win if you don't play. And it had a whole bunch of sort of happy examples of me on the cover of this or this, you know, kind of nice stuff. And, and it all came because I was open to the press and had Rick Atkins riding in the back of my Humvee to the fight to Baghdad and this, that, and the other thing. Um, then it said, you can't lose if you don't play. And now there's some unhappy ones, like when I had the Washington Post reporter with me where we decided to reopen a border with Syria on our own in the first year, uh, first months, in fact. Um, and we go out there and cut the ribbon, and there's hundreds of trucks lined up to come in, all with goods for the marketplace. And by the way, we'd found money, so the workers of Nainua province, Mosul, were going to be paid. By the way, what had happened is we found the money. I found the guy, and he said, you know, he could, didn't have the authority to pay it. But he said, but you do. I said, you're right, I do. He said, make it an order. So I signed an order to him. He said, great, no stamp. So we went out in the souk and bought a stamp. Anyway, so they're going to pay the workers. But with my clever economics knowledge uh, from grad school, I realized that we were about to dump more money on a closed economy. And the result of that would be inflation. Um, and so I had to get more goods into the marketplace. Went to the governor. We had the first election in Iraq. We already had a governor, a partner. I said, what do we do? He said, have you considered reopening the border with Syria? I said, I didn't even know we closed it. Remember, we weren't supposed to go to Mosul. We didn't have maps for it. We didn't have anything when we were ordered up there. And so we were still doing a lot of discovery learning. So anyway, we decided to open it up. We got the legal team with the UN Security Council resolutions governing trade, did promulgating instructions. A great brigade commander went out. And then the governor, I go out and I had a Washington Post reporter, and it was an extraordinary day. I mean, it was just, it was one of those very, very rare, awesome days in Iraq, because you've really made a difference in people's lives. You know, there's about a thousand sheikhs there all plotting and thanking, and we're wheeling with Apache helicopters around, and I'm waving, you know, the sheikh of the biggest tribe in northern Iraq. And um, as we're coming out, this Washington Post reporter says, General, what is this like? I mean, my God, you've just reopened a border. You've help the, the, the existence of thousands of people of Western Nainua province. And I said, well, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty exceptional. It's sort of like a cross between being the pope and the president. You know what the headline in the Washington Post was the next day. <laughs> now, I survived that. So you can't lose if you don't play. Um, and so a lot of people concluded, therefore, that, you know, the, the, the best press policy is uh, never, never pass up keeping your mouth shut. Um, but then I said, but you've got to play. And then I held a whole bunch of examples. You know, it's not my army. It's America's army. And America's mothers and fathers, uh, sons and daughters, or whatever, have a right to know what's going on. And we have an obligation to do it. So we walked our way through that. And I truly believe that it was hugely important. There have been people who have gone through missions and never gave an on-the-record interview, never interacted with the press, never took them with them. We always had people with us. Um, it doesn't mean that you're going to get favorable coverage. Uh, at, least, at least it means that they have been exposed to it. Uh, and we brought people over. We brought think tankers over who had criticized us. We brought think tankers over who had, who had praised us. Some of this stuff was hugely important. Um, I remember it was an op-ed piece by uh, Mike O'Hanlon of Brookings and uh, his comrade, uh, also I, I guess at Brookings or AEI, uh, that in... June or July of the surge, so before we were saying it, said, you know, the surge just may be working. And by the way, he took huge flack for that, except that he proved, was proved to be right. So again, you've got to engage, not just with the press, but with, again, with so-called intellectuals, influence makers, Stanford Business School, you know, whatever it is. Uh, and we used to do a lot of that. When I was a Central Command commander back from the surge in Iraq, we would take usually two days a month and we would do a, an outreach, and we'd go to a city, go to Atlanta, you'd do CNN editorial board, you would do uh, Georgia State, you know, what's the, the, one of the great universities that was there, we'd do a couple of things with them. 
Um, we'd do the Atlanta Constitution, and then we'd do something with some other gathering, uh, maybe the business executives from Northern National Security or whatever it was. And we, we really worked hard at that. And you just beat yourself up doing that. Um, you have to have a very efficient structure. I mean, I had commo guys with me all the time, so you're staying in touch. Uh, but, but I felt it was very important. And we did that with most of the major cities uh, in America. Thank you, sir. Um, we're going to turn it over to the audience for a couple questions and then close. So if we could get the first question from the audience. Thank you. General Pachez, thank you for being here. Uh, as a former Marine, Semper Fidelis. Semper Fi. For the past three decades, the foreign policy establishment has taken it for granted that global engagement is good for the United yeah. States. The 2016 election, however, suggests that the American people might not feel the same way. As a strategic leader, how would you, what big idea would you use to bring our foreign and military policy in line with the values and interests of the American middle class, and how would you communicate it? I think if you start again by being first with the truth, uh, you probably have a, a, a decent approach. And by this, I mean that um, political leaders and policymakers, I think, have tended to focus on the pluses of trade deals, of globalism, of opening our uh, economy to others, and then welcoming other countries into it, China into the WTO and, and, and so forth and so on, but have sometimes been a little bit less forthright about the fact that there are losers as well as winners when you have a trade deal. Um, and I think you have to go into this, and this is a challenge because the losers, this is an existential issue for them. I mean, in NAFTA, uh, once we did NAFTA, I think every shoemaking company in America, except for maybe one in New England, literally went out of business. The clothing manufacturers in North Carolina and the Eastern Coast went out of business. Again, uh, there, were, there were significant shifts, and certain sectors were completely decimated. And I think what you have to do is say, look, here's what is going to happen, again, to the best of your predictive ability. Then say, in view of that, we are going to have, there's something called TAA, Trade Adjustment Assistance. That is going to be longer and more substantial than we have ever done it in the past. Uh, we are going to help these sectors that are affected uh, to relocate, to reskill, to uh, adapt and to learn and so forth. And those that can't, we will be with them for life. Uh, but I think that's the kind of approach that you have to have rather than just this kind of simplistic, again, assumption, as you noted, that globalism is good. Well, actually, it's not for everybody. Uh, some are literally losing their livelihoods uh, because of that. Beyond that, I mean, I think right now we have to acknowledge as an example that many of our hopes and aspirations uh, for China's entry into the global trading and uh, world uh, trade organization and the rest of this, that as they got more enmeshed in trade, as they were more prosperous, as they engaged more in the world, that inevitably they would become more open, more transparent, uh, more you know, like us. Uh, and that actually has not been the case. And, and again, you can talk about the messaging and the message discipline and some of the rhetoric and all the rest of that without question, but I think this administration is the first that is actually doing something to reflect uh, the, the challenges that some of this has created for certain sectors uh, of the United States. I am a globalist. I do believe that the, the US should continue to lead the rules-based international order. I do believe that that rules-based international order uh, has served the world reasonably well since it was established in the wake of a 50-year period which saw two world wars in the Great Depression. But I also acknowledge that it is not without costs. Uh, it is not without downsides as well as upsides. And that if others are allowed to lead the rules-based organization or international order, uh, they may well change the rules in ways that will not necessarily be advantageous to us. Now, again, could you do this with a little less brinksmanship? Could you, you know, et cetera, et cetera? Sure. Uh, but it does need to be, to be acknowledged. And I think it was necessary uh, that, that this sentiment in the country, which is substantial enough, obviously, to have an impact on national and local elections, 
uh, is actually uh, observed, acknowledged, and then that there are actions taken as a result of that. Again, I say that as somebody who does believe uh, in that rules-based international order. By the way, I tend to believe that one of the biggest challenges today, a world that has revisionist powers, Islamist extremists, growing cyber threats, domestic populism, which is uh, really challenging democracies uh, in many places of the world, uh, dysfunction in Washington in various respects, all of that, that, that one of the biggest challenges is actually the strain and stress on the rules-based international order at a time when America, not just the administration, but Americans, uh, fairly substantial numbers of them, have some reservations about, or at least questions, about whether or not we should continue to, to lead it. Again, I believe we should. I do believe in the freedoms that we enjoy, of, along with the veterans here, obviously, have been felt privileged to, have, to protect those, in a sense, and by serving in the military. Uh, I believe that they're you know, the best for mankind and all the rest of this. But, but have to note that, again, all of our different aspirations have not necessarily uh, come to pass. And beyond that, I mean, we just have to also acknowledge the biggest single shift strategically right now in the overall context is that we are back in an era of renewed great power rivalries. Principally, of course, the strategic competition between the US and China, which we should also note that we're also our number one trading partner. So this is a very different competition from that, say, between the West and the East uh, during Soviet days. But it's also the resurgence of Russia. It's the gradual rise of, of India, uh, the shift of other great powers uh, around the world. And those dynamics are important. And this is what we've got to try to explain to folks uh, while being up front and recognizing that, again, there are people disadvantaged by some of these deals and, and, and by opening one's uh, economy to the rest of the world. And therefore, you need to take care of those people better than we have. Uh, and that's the whole reason that you have people that are so outraged at what has taken place. So we're almost out of time. So okay. I wanted to close with one last question. Yep. Um, you have over 40 veterans sitting before you today. How can we as private citizens and mm -hmm. as private businesses better serve veterans who return from combat? Well, I think, by the way, KKR has a Vets at Work program. Uh, I'm privileged to be the chairman of that. Uh, others candidly do the, the work, but you know we're, we do a lot of the, it's, you know, welcome to the real world. Um, but I do, I mean, I'm the, I do chair of the meetings, the VTCs, the, the hiring fairs, and all the rest of this, and it, and it has made a huge difference. Our portfolio companies, um, <clears throat> all of course in the U.S., these are, uh, have hired over 53,000 veterans and spouses, because we count spouses as well. We think that's another important component and another element to which we uh, have some obligation. But all of that is based on, on a fact that it's not just the right thing to do to hire veterans. It's actually the smart thing to do from a business perspective. Uh, veterans obviously bring a host of experiences, expertise. Uh, they've been tested often in combat. Uh, they've shown up for work, done early morning physical training in the rain and the cold, and all of these other uh, reasons, I think, that, that, again, they're very attractive to business. But what we then need to do uh, is we need to try to provide them career opportunities, not just jobs. Um, and sadly, what happens for a fair number of our veterans, especially those who are married and might have a couple of kids, uh, and they get out and they're they're worried and they haven't done all the prep they should have because we keep them working up until the final weeks. Uh, and then they finally get the transition program and all of a sudden the uniform's off and you know they've also lost the sense of mission larger than self, uh, the privilege of doing it with others who feel the same way and a sense of identity that comes from wearing a uniform. So you're out there and they jump at the first job that comes along and then hate life while guarding a parking lot for the next 20 years. We need to provide them, again, career opportunities. And the difference is that a career opportunity has the, the chance for advancement. And it's one in which they can advance if we provide them the training, the education, the mentoring, uh, affiliation groups, uh, focus groups, and all the rest of that uh, within that, that firm. So give them that kind of opportunity. And I think that's the way to discharge uh, the responsibility, really. I, I, I mean, it's a sacred obligation, I think, really, 
to veterans who, again, keep in mind in the post 9-11 period, have raised the right hand and taken an oath at a time of war, knowing that they were very likely to be asked to go off to war and sometimes to do it again and again and again as during the surge years of constant deployments. These are great Americans. Uh, they are typically the 1%. You know, we talk a lot about the 1%. Um, and I'm privileged to mingle with some of those there in the New York financial community. There's this other 1%, and that's the percentage of Americans that are in uniform at any given time. Uh, and again, we do owe, owe a lot to them. They, they really are, um, as Tom Brokaw said to me, actually, he was with us again, I think it was the first year in Iraq. He, we took him around and showed him all the different tasks that our soldiers were performing, everything from tactical operations to nation building and, and a host of others, helping with local governance and restoration of basic services and repair of facilities and everything else. And at the end of that, I remember he, he's getting on a helicopter and the blade's turning and he shouts in my ear, he says, you know, General, those World War II veterans that I wrote about, they may have been the greatest generation, but surely these individuals are America's new greatest generation. I firmly believe that. Uh, I feel very privileged to have, to have served with them on the battlefield, uh, and I remember remain very, very grateful to them for what they have done. But I want to end this uh, the way that I started. Uh, it is to remind you of the extraordinary privilege that you have. Uh, we talk about luck being what happens when preparation meets opportunity. I can imagine fewer, better ways to prepare uh, than doing what it is that you all are doing right here. And again, how fortunate it is that you are in one of these seats here today. There is that saying uh, in the scriptures about, you know, of whom to, of whom to whom much is given, much is expected, um, and much is expected of you because of what it is that you're able to do here. Uh, and I'm very confident because of my practice of affirmative leadership that you will, you will prove us all right. Thanks very Thanks much. So.